My name is Josh. I'm the youth pastor. For those of you who don't know me, welcome this morning. And as they said, this morning is Youth Sunday. And what that means is, well, one, we share embarrassing videos and photos of the kids because, hey, it's fun. Um, and two, we talk about some of the trips and things that God has been doing in the asylum this summer and over the year. And so we wanted to bring some of our students up. You recognize some of them because they did some things up there. Um, but they have some cool experiences to share with us from their experiences this summer on these trips. And we wanted to take a moment to hear from them. And so the first question we have for them is just simply, what was one of your favorite parts about either the missions trip or creation or both? Whatever you'd like. I'm Angelina, and I went on both the creation and the missions trip. My favorite like, part of just all of it is just the bonds that you form with them. Like, you're stuck with these people for a week, and there is no escaping. Like, I love them to death, and, like, the week just makes me realize this. And one of the bonds that was formed was Triangle Trash with Haley over there and Rachel, and we decided we needed a mascot, so that is why this little bear is with me right now. This is Javier Jr. We're going to pass him down the line. Okay. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ryan, and... Um my favorite part about creation was when I was um, worshiping God, and um, because that was my favorite, because that was my favorite, my favorite part, because um, because in the moment when I was worshiping God, I gave my my life to Him. Hi, I'm Zach. My favorite part about the mission trip was we served at this place called Food and Friends, and it's a place where they make and help deliver food for people with health issues, health needs, and they can't get it for themselves. So I was part of the group. We all got split up. I was part of the group that helped, went and delivered stuff through the city of D.C. It was very interesting. We used GPS and written directions. We only missed, we got lost once. So my name is Jonathan, and there were a lot of great experiences during the missions trip. But the funniest story would be the time that we helped out at Charlie's Place. And Charlie's Place, what they do is they give out free food and clothes to homeless people. So after we helped them distribute the food and clothing, there was a time where we were told to go find someone, sit down with them, talk with them. I walk up to this guy. I ask, hey, do you want to talk? He goes, yeah, sit down. So I sit down, introduce myself what are your hobbies? And he goes, I like to travel and I like photography. Well, that's great because I like to do those things too. We can talk about those. We start out talking about travel, which is pretty normal. We're just talking about our favorite places to visit. And then he goes on to photography. He pulls out his wallet, he opens it up, takes out a picture. There's this loaf of bread and behind it there's water rippling, sort of in the shape of a man's face. You know, more like the state of Montana than an actual man, but he points at it and goes, do you see the man's face? I go, yeah, I guess. And then he goes, that's the spirit of George Washington. And then he looks at me. Do you believe in reincarnation? Because I do. And I think that you must be the spirit of George, I mean, you must be the reincarnation of George Washington because you're a really nice young man and you smile a lot. And then he kept going. He told me that when I got home, I needed to write a letter to President Trump. And what I needed to tell President Trump was I needed to talk to him about the real problems our country was facing. And he would know who I am because he used to be the Egyptian pharaoh, King Tut. I'm Haley, and I went both on the mission trip and as well as to creation. And so my favorite part of creation was the first night we, Beth had come and uh, really, we all worshipped really hard that night. That was the first night that Chewy uh, accepted Christ into his life, so that was awesome to see, and uh, we, the songs were playing, we played What a Beautiful Name, and then Reckless Love, and then it came to It as well, and um, my mom, who's actually sings here on the worship team, she was just singing, uh, she normally sings that song whenever it's played here, and you know, I in my head I was thinking about how passionately she sings the song, and how she sings it for the Lord and not for herself, and and then I think, I look up and I see Christine DeMarco who, from Bethel who's singing the song. And I see how passionately she sings it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, that's like my mom. 
And next thing you know, like, I fall to my knees in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, I can see him and I can feel him. And his presence is made known, very well made known that night. And I, you know, trying to sing the song and I just can't because I'm, I'm crying. And, you know, I, I look around and I see every single one of the youth members then down on their knees with me as well. And they're not doing it to follow me. They're doing it because they feel the Holy Spirit's presence as well as well, excuse me. Um, so that was awesome. Mission trip was definitely, we were at the Air and Space Museum, and um, I really am no fan of astronomy at all, so I got really bored really quick. As soon as I walked in, I was like, ugh. And so I was like, it would be a great idea like if I, I, can, I can make this fun and enjoyable for myself. So as you heard my Irish accent, as I welcomed you all to Life Point this morning, um, I, I did an Australian accent, and I gave a tour to the youth of the, the Air and Space Museum. And so the best part, they, they loved it. And so I was like, uh, you know, welcome to the Air and Space Museum. It's wild here. It's crazy out here in the Air and Space Museum. And we come to this, uh, you know, this vest. And I, I just want to show you the all, not the vest, but the actual the mannequin behind it. You know, has no head, has no arms, has practically no limbs except like a body. And I, uh, you know, and so just talking about it. And two men walk up and they're like, we're just trying to figure out what's so interesting about this vest. And I was like, nothing about the vest. You can probably go buy it down though at Kohl's, I think. Buy it twenty ninety nine. If you want to go down there, that's fine. Um, and but I don't know if it was at Kohl's, okay? Um, but yeah, that was probably my favorite part. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> on to the serious part of this. How did these trips help you grow spiritually this summer? Uh, during creation, uh, there was a point where I went off with one of my friends, like. We were just walking and talking. We were supposed to go to a speaker. We did go. I promise we went. <laughs> okay. So we, we got to the speaker. We set up our chairs. And like, the speaker started talking. Then they started talking. They just spilled everything out to me, like everything that was on their mind. And it, it, I don't know. It felt like I was supposed to be there at that moment. And God wanted me to kind of let her, like, let her know that her life was going to be... It's going to be all right. God is with her at all times. I feel like I was the route he went through to get the message across. And then at the missions trip, it, was, it happened way before we were even there. It was the morning we were supposed to leave. And I, I panicked and I broke down and I was like, I'm not going. I'm not going. So my mom told me to like get in the car. Like We'll see what happens when you're at church. And as soon as I got in the car... Um, all in started playing on Caleb and I don't know that was kind of the moment it was like okay God you want me to do this I'm gonna do this for you a way that I grew spiritually um was um at the missions trip um I God gave me courage to do uh, a lot of things there because it's it's really scary a lot of things that we had to do but he gave me the courage and I got through it so a way that I grew spiritually on the mission trip was, like Jonathan said about Charlie's Place, we were there, and there was a guy there, he told us his story, and at the beginning, like, he had this job, had a life, like, he was, go things were going great, and then he got released from his job and became homeless, and then he found Charlie's Place, started helping there, and, like, he has a job now. So what that told me was, through thick and thin, you should never lose sight of God and not, like, lose hope. Because I've been through a lot this year and a lot of ups and downs. And this guy went through being homeless and not having anything to not losing sight of God. I would say that the trip helped me to become more compassionate. Because before the trip, I would see someone who's needy and go, well, if he's homeless, then why doesn't he just go get a job so he can buy a house? Or she has a really nice car, so she should be able to pay for her food. And on the trip, I got to talk to some people, like Reggie, the guy that Zach was talking about. And it helped me realize that these are like normal people with hopes and dreams. And a lot of them are trying very hard to achieve them. But there are a lot of circumstances and complicated reasons why someone might be homeless or hungry. 
One thing that I will take out from both the creation and the mission trip was definitely the mission trip by far put my life in perspective and it, you know, showed me how much I take for granted of the fact that, you know, I have food that I can go get all the time. Um, I have a bed that I can actually sleep in every night that's extremely comfortable um, compared to some of the people who are experiencing homelessness in D.C., um, and, and on top of that, that God is always with me through whatever I do and that he's always there. Every time I serve someone, that he's going to be at the core, even if it's on a soccer field where he might not seem present or even if it's in school where he might not be present, um, he's present always. And for creation, it was definitely just a refreshing moment after coming out of an extremely hard school uh, year of school that, you know, now I'm going to become a freshman and I need sort of a reassurance that it's going to be okay, that things are going to go well. And, Jesus definitely opened up my eyes and definitely said that he's going to never leave me. He'll always be there, especially um, through creation and just the mission trip. Thanks, guys. You can give him a round of applause this morning. You can go ahead and grab a seat. So uh, what you guys got to see is a glimpse into <laughs> some of the craziness um, and also um, the stuff that God uh, does in the lives of our students. And, and I say a glimpse because it's only a small portion of our group and everybody has different stories about the way God has impacted them. One of the, one of the things I love as a youth pastor is getting to witness the way God helps our students grow spiritually. Whether it's on trips like this where God's impacting them on a missions trip when they are forced out of their comfort zone to go talk to people on the street that they've never met before, or it's stuff on creation where they're bonding together and, and supporting each other and being there for each other and seeing how God can use them in the lives of other people. I love being able to see students who go from being terrified of stepping out of their comfort zone for God to being invigorated by being able to actually do something for God and seeing the gifts that God has given them and how they can use it. I love seeing students who are able to trust God more as time goes on. And we see it countless times, whether it's at events like this, things we're doing in the youth group, or just in general, I get to witness students who three years ago look completely different than they did then now. That God has completely changed their lives through the interaction of family and volunteers and people that have come around them and helped them grow to know God more and grow spiritually. And as we enter into this series, Glenn started last week kicking us off by talking about the core ingredient of a family. And yes, he cooked bacon, and I'm sorry I don't have bacon this morning, okay? That's a hard follow-up, guys. I need to, like, bring a full breakfast. No, I'm just joking. Uh, so, but he talks about this core ingredient that is love. And I want to talk this morning about another core component of a strong family that I believe when we take it seriously, it grows and grows the key ingredient in our family. And that thing today is our spiritual life, our spiritual growth. Because I think that families, strong families, take their spiritual life seriously. The strong families take their spiritual life seriously. What I mean by that is that they take their relationship with God seriously, their family's relationship with God seriously, that it is a priority in their life. I've witnessed this time and time again as a youth pastor looking at families. I've witnessed this in my own family that when the family takes God seriously and takes their spiritual life seriously, the family itself becomes stronger. And God does incredible things through that family. And so that's why this morning I want to talk about what it looks like to take our spiritual life seriously and why it's so important, what God does through it. To do that, I want to go look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Before we read it, I want to talk a little bit just about the context to this verse. So God gives his commandments, right, to the Israelite people. And then right before this passage, we have a section where God tells Moses to tell the Israelite people to be careful to, to live these out and train up their families to do the same thing. Because in doing this, they're living out their relationship with God and living into the things that God desires for them to live out so that they can experience the incredible things that God has planned for them. It's because that God's plan is ultimately better than anything else we could have planned for ourselves. And so he's calling the Jewish people to live this out. And then we come into this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, and we get a roadmap for what this looks like to take the spiritual life of our family seriously, to take living for God seriously. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So what we have here is a road map. A road map to taking spiritual life seriously. And it starts in a very interesting way. It starts with something that the Jewish people came to know as the great Shema. And what that was was an important core value to their entire system of commandments and their spiritual life. That they believed you could sum up the commandments into this statement. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That it was the core thing underneath all of it. And what I find interesting about this is that the core thing underneath all of it is love, love for God. That the core to our spiritual life, the core to spiritual growth, the core to following God, the starting point is love for God. And we know this is still important because when Jesus is asked what's the most important commandment, the most important thing you can do, the thing that you need to remember above everything else, he quotes this passage. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then Jesus goes on to explain more of how that works in relationships. But he quotes this. Love God. Love him with everything you have. This is important because I think we learn something about what it looks like to take our spiritual life seriously and how we can do it. It starts with intentionally watching over our own relationship with God. To take your spiritual life seriously, you need to start with intentionally watching over your own relationship with God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I don't know how many of you guys have ever experienced this while driving, and I hope so. There were some people in first service, and it made me feel a lot better. So I really hope we can bond this morning over this happening, or else you're all just going to think we're never letting Josh drive any students ever again, okay? So uh, I have this experience where I'm driving, and it's this experience where you're driving right, and you're driving for like 10, 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden you look back and you think, I don't really remember the last 10 minutes of driving. Like, not that like I forgot the time completely, but I'm like, did I stop at that stop sign? I think I did, right? Anybody ever experienced this before? Anybody? Yes, I'm not alone this morning. Okay, awesome. Okay, so like, I've experienced this in my own life when you're driving. The time that it happened the worst recently is my wife and I were house-sitting for my parents. And my parents live in Anvil, and my wife and I live in Cleona. So first of all, we're not that far away, okay? So, but like I'm driving back from the church, and we were house-sitting the whole week, and I remember driving back, and every time I would drive back, there's like one major turn onto a church called Hill Church Road that takes me to my house. And if I want to go to my parents' house, I go straight, okay? So here's what happened. Four days in a row, I didn't go straight, okay? I kept turning down Hill Church Road, okay? Because I was distracted, thinking about everything that was going on that day, what I had to do. Apparently, you know, taking care of my parents' house wasn't priority number one. Um, And I kept turning to my house. And I would love to say that the second I made the turn, I was like, Josh, come on, like, turn around. No, it's like five minutes later, I'm like on my way, like, "Eh, oh, crap. Okay, like, and realized I had to go to my parents' house. Okay, so it turned around. You know, we laugh at this, but I think we're often this way in our relationship with God. We do what I like to call going on autopilot. We go through the motions. We get distracted by the life that's surrounding us. Everything that we have to deal with that day takes over, and we stop intentionally investing in our relationship with God. And before we know it, we look back a week, two weeks, two months later, and we realize, like, what have I been doing? We haven't been investing in connecting with God. We haven't been investing in in, in knowing Him and hearing from Him and living for Him. And we look back and we've let the things of our day just distract us. For good reason. I mean, some of you guys are driving, you're coming home and you got like 18 soccer games to deal with that night, or you've got five meetings that night, or you're trying to get home and just for goodness sakes, make a meal, right? Like we've got all this stuff going on, but the reality of it is if we neglect our relationship with God, we're missing out on something incredible in our lives and we're hurting the the possibilities of what God could do in our family through us. We need to intentionally watch over our relationship with God. 
And that means treating our relationship with God like any other relationship we have, prioritizing connecting with him, prioritizing hearing from him, prioritizing talking to him, making him a priority in our every day, in our every moment. I mean, imagine if we treated some of our other relationships like we do with God. If I came home and didn't talk to my wife for three weeks, I would be in a lot of trouble, okay? And the relationship would not be healthier. We need a relationship with God. We need to be connected with God. We were created to be connected with God. And if we are ever going to grow spiritually and experience the life that God has put before us and has created us for, we need to connect with him. And that's why this verse starts with love. Because we will never spiritually grow until our love for God grows. We need to grow in our relationship with God. And so that means taking time to hear from him. Open his word, read it, look at it, study it, understand what he has to say to us. And this doesn't mean that you have to start your morning with like a six-hour Bible study. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just take a couple minutes in your day to, to open God's word. Some people, they put it in places in their car because every time they go to look up at the rearview mirror, they need reminded that God is with them because that person behind them is also with them and it's a dangerous moment, okay? They need to be reminded of the truth that is God's word. And we need to prioritize the things in our our lives that connect us with that. That's why Sunday mornings are so important so that we can hear what God has to say to us and we can connect with that. And that's why I love life groups too, because it takes what happens on a Sunday morning and it moves it to a more personal place where you can dig deeper and get all the Bible verses that Glenn was not able to fit on a Sunday morning and work on them together and talk about them together so that you can not just read them, but begin to understand them and know the God who said them. And so we need these in our life so that we can connect with him. We need to talk to him. We need to share with him. We need to tell him when we're feeling overwhelmed and trust him. Whether that's starting our morning each morning off by talking to him or it's praying in that second where you feel like you're going to lose it, you need to talk to God. Thank him for what he's done for you. Talk to him every single day. The God of the universe is accessible for you to love and prioritize, so make sure you do it because you will never be the same when you do. And so make sure you connect with God, speaking to God, talking to him, hearing from him, and then living out what he asks you to do. Because it's in those things, it's in worshiping him through song, through action that we show God he matters. It's through those things that we connect with God. It's through those things that we grow, that God shows us how he made us and how he can use us. And it's all these things combined that grow our love for God. And we need that relationship. We need to start with intentionally being awake and making sure that tomorrow we know God better than we did the day before. Because as we do it, God does amazing things in our lives. He makes us stronger. He doesn't take away all the problems, but he makes us stronger to be able to handle them. He develops us. He changes us. We need to be connected to the God of the universe. And so if we're going to take our spiritual lives seriously, we need to start with watching over that relationship that we are able to have. Now, what's the next step of this? Because just watching over our own relationship is not the full process of being intentional with our spiritual life and our family. There's another part of this, and we see it in Deuteronomy 7 to 9, the, the next part of the verses that we read. It says this, impress them on your children, them being the commandments, the things that God has told you, the way to live, the way to connect with him, the way to follow him, the way to know him, impress them, that onto your children. Now it says children here, but we can apply this to our whole family. This is a specific example, but we can apply this to the way we interact with all of our family. He says, make sure that they know this. Make sure that they see how to do it. Now, some of you may be sitting here and going, that's great, Josh, but how do I actually do that? That's a great question. I always love when you guys ask things that are like, here. He's like, good. Okay, so let's look at the rest of the verses. It says this. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. 
So what God says is first, watch over your own relationship, connect with me, get to know me because I'm here and I want to know you and I will change you. And then he says, take that and make sure that your family knows how to do that as well. And the way that he tells us how to do that is he talks about this sitting up and getting down. Now, you could take this very literally. I joked with this in the first service. And like every time you sit up and, and like sit down, you're like, kids, come over here. Dad needs to talk about God today. And I stood up. Okay, so you could take it very literally. Okay, don't, no. That's, okay, what it's really trying to do here is it's trying to say that, that you should have God being a part of every moment of your day, that, that your day should be surrounding around him. That, that, that throughout your day, God should be a priority and important. And, and what I think we learn from this is that we need to weave Christ into everyday life. It teaches us that we leave a lasting impact in our family by intentionally weaving Christ into everyday life. Intentionally taking God and making sure that he's a part of our everyday interactions with our family and those who are close with us. Making sure that he is a major part of our day. Weaving it in, strategically making it a part of the interactions. It's living our relationship with God out loud why we're living our relationship with other people. It's making sure that God is within our relationships and intentionally living that out. And that, that may mean having actual conversations with the people in your family about God and about what God's been teaching you or about things that you're thinking about with God or something that you read or just, just talking about God with your family. How many of us go throughout our day and we don't even remember to bring up the conversation of the God who made us with our family? And I'm speaking to myself just as much as anybody else. In the busyness of life, how many times do I walk into the house and I forget to talk to my wife about this stuff or we forget to take time to just sit down and talk about what God's been doing in our lives? You know, my dad was somebody who was great at this. He would have conversations with me about stuff uh, like this, whether it was in the car. You know, I, I heard a pastor recently joke about that the car is the best place to do this because your kids are stuck. So they've got nowhere to go, okay? So he uh, talks about doing it there. My dad was a person who did that. Would, would just bring that type of stuff up. And it wasn't always like this profound like, thing. It was just talking about what he had learned or what he had saw or, or something that God had showed him that day or something that he was thinking about. And, and I don't want to paint this beautiful picture over it and be like, I was like as a teenager, like, Dad, you are so right. Man, you are the wisest person I've ever heard. Yeah, I'm going to go do this. Like, now. Like, stop the van. I'm going right now. Okay? That didn't happen. Okay? My dad would talk about this, and I would most likely be like, uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah. But here's the thing. I remember those moments. And here's the thing. Over time, those moments built my understanding of who God was. They built my understanding of what it looked like to follow God. And it made me realize that God was important to my father because he wouldn't stop talking about him. And when we do this with our family members, it's not just a parent-to-kid relationship. Kids, you can do this with your parents, and it makes an impact on them. Whether you're an adult now and your parents live somewhere else, or you're a teenager living in your house, for goodness sakes, if you're a teenager and you start talking to your parents about God, first of all, they're going to have a heart attack that you're talking to them. Okay? Second of all, that's going to make a large impact on them. I've seen it. I've seen families where kids come to Christ and their parents don't know Christ and a kid starts talking about what God's doing to them. And it just changes a family. We need to start having intentional conversations with the people we're close with about God and about what God is doing in us. It's in those places that we work out who God is. It's in those places that we work out to understand how God thinks of us and we help other people work that out. It's why we need each other because we do these things together. And so we need to intentionally weave these conversations in. The other part of this is intentionally living it out. Living out what God calls you to do. Living it out around your family members. Living it out around those who are close to you. Being Jesus to the people you live with, to the family that you have. It, it means taking in that self-sacrificial love and just loving the people in your family. Showing what that looks like in the interactions you have with your wife or with your husband. 
Showing those interactions the way you deal with your parents or your siblings or the people around you. Showing God's love to your parents and, and being kids and being all over that place. The whole family showing what it looks like to be Christ to each other. And what starts to happen is that God grows a stronger love for each other in that family and a stronger love for God and what he can do. And he grows an entire family to look at what it looks like to follow Christ. We need to start serving each other, living it out. You mess up. You screw up. Don't throw it under the rug. Show your family what it looks like to say, I'm a sinner, but I've got a Christ who's stronger. Say that in your family. Live that out with your family. Prioritize those things within your family. Prioritize what God calls you to do in your family because it communicates to everyone else that's close to you that God is more important and his mission is way bigger and more important than anything else we can commit our time to. And that's not saying we don't commit our time to sports and other things around us. Those things are great, but how do you do those things? By living like Christ while doing them. It's taking the moments to serve as a family together, prioritizing the stuff that happens at church and on Sunday mornings, prioritizing those into your life as a family so that you can see and show each other what it looks like to be Christ and what's important. These things can change a family when they're talking about God and when they're trying to live for him. It leaves an impact. It's important. You know, I, I come to you as this this morning. Listen, I, I'm going to be honest. Okay? When, when I started making this message and working through it and working through the passage, the first thought crossed into my head, Josh, you are a youth pastor who is 27 and has no kids, and you're going to start trying to talk about like spiritual discipleship and stuff in your family. Half of the church is going to hate you, okay? Those were the thoughts running through my head, okay? So I'm trying to be honest with you guys. Listen, I'm not a parent, Yes, I have two cats, but as I remind my wife over and over again, they don't count. Okay, so I'm not trying to sit up here and tell you that I know how this all works and I'm doing this every day because obviously I'm not. I don't have kids in my family life, but I grew up in a family that does this and I try to do it in my family, in my relationship with my wife, and I try to live it out to the people that are close to me. And it's that family that made a difference in my life. My parents lived this out. You know, those of you who don't know my story, I, I grew up with uh, two great parents, and, but my dad and I, we always had a rough relationship early on, especially going up into like the middle of middle school. We, we did not have a great relationship, and it was not because my dad was a bad father. That's not what I'm saying at all. He was a great dad. It's just that I was the first kid, so I was an experiment. Um, and I was a tough experiment, okay, because um, much like my dad, I was very passionate. I know that's a surprise. Um, and I would get, we would fight a lot, and I was hard-headed, and, and he was a little hard-headed, and we'd go at each other, and it would just explode, and him and I just did not have a great relationship early on. I always felt like I had to be perfect, I always felt like there was this pressure to, to, to always have myself have everything right. And it's not because he said that to me. It was just the way our interactions were. But when I was younger, my parents started going to this church. It was this church in Cleona. And uh, they started going because of family friends at work, um, from what I understand, that, that got them going there. And so I remember sitting in a car with my dad the one day and him saying, hey, you know, we're going to go to this church thing. Are you cool with that? And little young Josh was like, sure, because I have no idea what that is, okay? So and we started going. And what I started to see is that over time, and I didn't realize this at the time, I looked back and started to realize what was happening. God was working in my family. And my parents were coming closer and closer to Christ. And they were starting to follow him. And all of a sudden, the priorities in our house started to change. And my relationship with my dad started to change. And over time, we started to grow to have this relationship of not two people butting heads. Sure, we still did that at times because I was a teenager. But we started to have this relationship of a father who intentionally was trying to teach me what was the most important thing in life. He was trying to show me what it looked like to show someone grace even when they're wrong. And I started to have this relationship with my father that started to develop into something incredible. And my mom was the same way. And what I, what I grew up in this house was two parents who prioritized God above everything else. 
You know, I said, my dad used to have these conversations with me. He would, he would have these intentional conversations with me. I remember one time being at a boardwalk and I don't, I have two younger sisters and, and them and my mom were somewhere. I don't remember, I think they were shopping. Sure, that sounds good. Um, and so they weren't there, but I remember standing at this boardwalk with my dad on vacation. And my dad just looking out over the water and saying, I don't know how anybody couldn't believe in a God when you look at how beautiful this creation is. And again, I'm not trying to give you a rosy picture of it. As a teenager, I was like, sure. (laughs) But I remember that conversation. And I remember the countless other conversations that he had. And I remember the times that he would sit in front of me when he felt like he fell short and messed up and would actually admit it to me. And I would see when he would do that with my mom and I would see when he would try to to put my mom first in everything. And I would see that even in the busyness of life, he was still prioritizing trying to live for Christ and trying to advance the mission of our church and the goodness of God every single day. And my mother was the same way in the crazy busyness of driving me to Greencastle, Pennsylvania for some band that I had just joined to driving me to karate lessons. And I didn't stick with them. Don't worry about it. Um, so, but driving me to all these things and even in the midst of it, still running, running kids ministries and helping kids and discipling people and prioritizing church. And we, we did not miss Sunday morning unless something important came up because Almost nothing was more important than connecting with God. And over time, what this did is built into me a desire to love God more than anything else. It built into me an understanding that God was more important than anything else in my life. It built into me an understanding that there was an incredible God who built the universe, who still loved me enough to send his son, and who wanted to use me to make a difference in this world. Sure, I learned those stuff from youth pastors. I learned that stuff from people all through my life. But the thing that has stuck with me the most is the parents who have been with me the whole way and have consistently tried to teach me these things. It was from the conversations to the moment that my dad did something that that he needed to come to me and it was huge. And I remember sitting in a dining room as he's crying, sharing with me what he had done and asking for forgiveness. In that moment, a kid learned what it meant to admit that you're a sinner. And it's these things that built into me my relationship with God. And I am standing here before you this morning as a byproduct of these parents who continually invested in our family spiritual life. And I am so thankful for it. And so I charge you this morning, I encourage you this morning, God has placed people in your life he wants you to intentionally invest in. He wants to use your connection with him to help those people grow as well. Parents, I can tell you for sure it's your children. Children, guess what? It's still the rest of your family. God wants to use you and your family. It's your spouse. It's your husband. It's your wife. It's the people you're close to, roommates, people you have close relationships with, people that are like family to you. God wants you to use, the, use you to help them grow. And in the process, he'll grow you too. The reality of it is, is that when we take our spiritual lives seriously, we connect on a deep level with the God who grows real love in our families and our families become stronger. God uses those families to make a different whether, difference, whether it's your family impacting another family or it's your kid impacting another kid or your wife impacting someone at work because of the growth that's happening at home. It's a powerful thing. Our churches are stronger when the families are stronger and connected to God. And so please don't wait another day. You need this. Your family needs this. So take it seriously. I know that things are busy. I know that life is crazy. But this is an incredibly important thing that will help us through all of that. And I promise, it may seem like tomorrow what you're doing is not making a difference, but I promise, I stand here as a testament to that, that what you're doing will make a difference. God will use it. So let's take our spiritual life seriously. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this church, 
for the people here. Father, I thank you that you want to have a relationship with us, that you want to help us help our families, that you want to come into our families, that you want to help us be stronger, that you want to be a part of our lives. I thank you for that. Father, just help us see the places in our life that we can connect with you better. Help us connect the loved ones that we have, the people that are close to us better with you. Father, please, whoever's here this morning, you know what their life is like. And so I just pray that you come into their life right now and you empower them to connect with you and you empower them to empower their families. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.